Well, welcome everybody to UPAA Live. I think this is week eight. Uh, we just keep on we just keep on rolling. <clears throat> so before I jump into this, is the the title of our discussion today: communicating our value as university photographers. Um, I did want to have a couple of reminders. First of all, in the very first week of UPAA Live, uh, we talked about digital asset management, and what I did is I went and created a blog post. I kind of made it more long form and explained. Uh, a little more in depth of what we were trying to do. So it's, I, I kind of look at it as a white paper and it has all the information you need to get going with digital asset management. But also because we have bosses, I figured it would be a good idea to have a video because you know maybe they don't like to read too much. So I created a video, uh, about 13 minute video explaining what it is. And this is the best frame grab I could get. It's just kind of a reminder that I should never ever make videos. But yeah, so if you want to go check that out, here's the, here's the link to it, byufoto.exposure.co backslash adam dash basics. Uh, look at it. If you have any questions, let me know. If you have any corrections, let me know. I appreciate it. A lot of people have been helping me kind of add to it and make it better. And again, we have a reminder, we have the digital symposium coming up in, in June. Uh, it's replacing the physical symposium, but we're still going to try and have a lot of fun. These are the speakers we've announced so far, but as we were just talking about, there's gonna be some more announcements coming next week, probably. And uh, we may have some speakers we're announcing, we may have some prizes we're announcing, stay tuned, but I think it's gonna be fun. So make sure you block out that week to join us for, for the digital symposium. Uh, and again, if you have any more information, here's the, the website, the digital symposium website. Now, a lot of people have been asking, do I need to register? No, it costs nothing. There's no need to register, but if you do feel the need to look at the accommodations, I put some information down in the description on that webpage. So go check it out. So let's get going. Uh, today's discussion is one that's been a long time coming. Um, I've been thinking about, like say, I think this is, uh, I think it's been eight weeks since we've been doing, doing UPA live from, for a lot of us, we've been on lockdown for about eight or nine or 10 weeks. And I was thinking back to that very first UPA live. And the reason I wanted to do it is I felt like there's a lot of us that are stuck at home. We need something to do. We might as well work on our digital asset management, some of our organizational skills, maybe our photo skills, and prepare for the time which we could come back to campus. Now, I thought we would be back by now. I thought, I thought it would be quicker than it was, but um, of course, things happen, right? We, we, we didn't fully understand what we were dealing with. And now, now that we're a couple months into it, uh, a lot of ideas have emerged and a lot of challenges are happening. In fact, the week after the first UPA live, we, we started seeing some of our photographers getting furloughed and laid off and that was really just disheartening. And the economic impact of the coronavirus um, and the pandemic is gonna be far reaching for universities. It really is. It's something that we're gonna all have to deal with in one shape uh, or another. And for probably a couple of years, the, the effects are gonna be felt at universities for a couple of years. In our Facebook page, Brett Skeklin said, uh, wrote this quote and it's just stuck with me. It sounds like nobody outside of our marketing group realizes the value in all the work photographers do outside the actual of the actual photography. And I'll tell you when I when I read that it just it just struck me and it's haunted me since. Um, it, and it's absolutely one of the biggest challenges we face as university photographers. They just think we're button pushers and and you know all we do is push buttons and smile and have fun and they have to go do the real work. But the big challenge is, is how do we communicate the value that we bring to a university? A lot of universities think that they can just hire a freelance photographer and it's gonna be a lot cheaper and they're gonna get a lot more out of it. But let's look at what the value of a freelance photographer is. First of all, they'll give you photos. Some of them will be good, others not so much. But the one thing you're always gonna get from a freelancer is an invoice. And that's it. That's really all it is, because for them it's just a job. It's just a paycheck. So. On the other hand, as a university photographer, we bring so much more. First of all, we bring photos that have multiple uses. They're not just gonna be a one-time thing. They're something that can be used in stock and archive and other things. We, bring, we, we create photos that help with the messaging of the present, with the, with the messaging of the university, we help try and communicate ideas and thoughts. We create photos that are in line with the branding of the university. And in fact, I would say that photographers create the visual identity of the university because most of the photos that are gonna be seen about your university come from you. So you, are, you create that visual identity and that's so important. Another thing that we bring is metadata. Obviously, 
the, 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 good, the value of good metadata is something we talked a lot about last few weeks. And the metadata is something that's gonna help those photos be useful going forward. Digital asset management goes along with that also. Um, a university photographer, when they have a good digital asset management system, they're organized, they're, it's easy to find what needs to be found. And again, those photos are usable going forward. They're also archived, they're saved for later. Also, culture. I think that when we work on a campus, we understand the culture of our university. What's important, what's unique, what's special. And we can capture and communicate that visually. And finally, you know, the, we talk about the UPAB and the visual historians. We are, we're the historians of the university. In a hundred years, it's your photos that are gonna tell the story of your university, not some random guy's Twitter feed, right? Those photos are so important. They, 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 they have so much value and they will get more valuable as we go on. So I think we're all on the same page. We agree that this is what's important about what we do. This is what we, this is who we are. The real question is, how do we communicate that? How do we help other people understand all of these things? The truth of the matter is this folks, it all comes down to data. We need to make sure that we're communicating the data that's important to, to, to share these ideas and these thoughts and these feelings. Because administrators, they don't speak photo. They don't understand f-stops. They don't under, care about pixels. Um, there's this communication gap between us and them. We need to make sure that, that we are doing the best we can to bridge that communication gap. Here's an, it's just an example of what I'm talking about. This is a photo I created many years ago. Uh, it's for a story, a news release we did on how shocking language was making into juvenile fiction. So I thought it'd be a fun idea to get somebody really shocked. And I'm sure there were some vampires in the book too. Um, and honestly, this is a five minute photo. And people ask me all the time, well, how much hairspray did it take to get that hair to go like that? And I'm like, well, none, it's called gravity. Really simple shot, <clears throat> excuse me. My student laid down on the table in her office. This is our normal background portrait, our normal background lighting, I just moved the light over. It was seriously a five minute shot. And of course it did really well. People loved the photo, but it, was, it didn't take much, right? Now let's compare that five minute photo to this photo. And I've talked about this photo before. This is a photo of a dancer on a Swan, for a Swan Lake promotion. And this is no Photoshop, she's on top of a lake. Um, this is a photo that took a lot of work to make happen. I had to first convince them that it's, it was worth doing. I had to go Google Earth and scout to find the right lake that was, had a good sunset behind it. Then I had to do the work and physically go and scout the lake. Then I had to get everybody arranged. And then we had to cancel three different times because weather was bad. And then we actually got to do it. It was about five days of work for this one photo. So the, the and I think that that's it's a great photo and it, and it does a lot for our university. But here's the thing. When an administrator looks at these two photos, do you know what they see? Two photos. They don't understand the difference between the two. They just see two photos. And that's on us. That's something we need to be better about communicating what it takes to, to create these types of things. Now, both photos have value. Just because one took longer than the other doesn't mean that it's more valuable than the other. Both have value, but they're not gonna be equal in what it takes to create them. And that's really an important point. I do like to think about what does it look like from our boss's point of view? First of all, photographers have gotta be the worst to manage, right? First of all, our camera equipment is expensive. It's rough. And we keep on asking for all these little doodads to go with our cameras and they just kind of think we want more toys. I think bosses are always asking, are they actually working? You know, he's turning the dial on his camera, but what's, what's he doing, right? And the, the question that every manager has to ask themselves, are they being effective? Are they being efficient? I think that, that, that communication gap that we have is, comes down to this, is that we're creatives and we work in a creative field. And we have to make emotional decisions every single day, whether or not to use the wide angle, whether or not to go shallow depth of field. Those, those are tied to emotion, right? It's hard to explain those to somebody that doesn't understand photography. But our bosses, they can't afford to make those emotional decisions. They have to sit in these meetings and the, with these boardrooms and have to make decisions of millions of dollars. They can't be emotional decisions because administrators have to make decisions that are based on data. That's the only thing they can do. That's their language. So we need to learn to speak this language. I, uh, I mentioned before, I served a mission uh, for my church in Los Angeles and I, I was a Spanish speaking missionary. I had to learn Spanish so that I could actually communicate with the people. And they would always make fun of my Spanish because it's bad, right? Had a really bad gringo accent. But they appreciated the fact that I was trying. And because I was trying, 
they were more attentive to what I was trying to say. I don't think it's any different when we're dealing with our administrators, when our, we're dealing with others at our university, we need to learn to speak their language. Let me give you an example. Let me get... I can go to my boss and I can say, boss, I'm working too much. Now that, that, that statement may be true, but it's an emotional statement. There's no data attached to it. There's nothing that she can actually do with this statement. But what's the difference when I do this? Well, boss, last month I worked 11.3 hours a day, 11 nights, four weekends. I captured 45,000 frames and 47 hours of shooting and I completed 53 photo shoots. That's data. That's something she can do something with, right? That's, so, that's useful to her. So that's, a, that's when, I, when I talk about we need to communicate with data, that's what I'm talking about. These are some of the metrics that we create and share with our departments, with our bosses, with our university. We track frames uh, that we shoot. Every single frame we shoot, we track. How many different photo shoots we do, how many hours we're shooting, the different colleges and departments that we're doing work for, how many nights we're working, how many weekends we're working, how much travel we're doing, how many travel days we're doing. Also, how, much, how our photos are being used and where they're being used. And very importantly, download statistics to show how useful is our stock gallery. So I, I give my boss all these spreadsheets that has all this great information on it, how many frames we shoot, how many hours, uh, what each breakdown by every single photographer, how productive we are. They love charts. Bosses love spreadsheets, guys, colors. So that we give them as many spreadsheets as we can give them. This is a breakdown of, of, of our time spent per department taking pictures. And all that's created with something we call the shoot log. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but it's a very simple way to gather this information and to also share it. And then finally, again, tracking usage. Um, on our Libra side, it's very easy for me to go and see that in the past 90 days, we had 38,563 stock images downloaded. Now think about that. 60 of those 90 days, we were shut down. And that's extremely important information for my boss to have to know that, hey, this is being used. People are home and they're using the stock site to continue doing their work, to work on their projects. That's extremely, extremely important. So I think that it's really important. But before I take questions, I just want to say, you know, bosses, bosses are interesting, aren't they? Uh, bosses. Hey, Jaren, before you start talking about bosses, carries on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so she's listening to you. <laughs> well, uh, you want to introduce Carrie for us? Yeah, so uh, Carrie Jenkins is joining us, our boss, um, to answer a few questions that, that Jaren has prepared and then any questions that you guys may have. Um, and Carrie, forgive me, I don't, I, I'm not sure your official title, Assistant to the President for University Communications, something like that. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, uh, I'll turn the time back to, to Jaren and, and Carrie for a little interaction. Well, I won't ask you how long you've been listening, Carrie, but thanks for joining us. It's good to, it's good to be with you. I always, I always love to be with this team. Well, and, and, and those that don't know, Carrie is our boss and actually at Symposium, she's the one that welcomes us to campus every time we have Symposium here. So this is kind of your welcome to Symposium moment, Carrie. But we're, we're thankful for all your support with that. Uh, we did have some questions for you though, if that's okay. Sure. Um, we've been talking about the data that we create. I give you all this information. I give you all these stats and these spreadsheets. How do you, you use those, that information? And, and I, I, it just, something just occurred to me, um, Jaren, as, as you were talking, when I um, first came into my position and um, our advancement vice president, what had been the former dean of the Marriott School of Business in accounting, he is a, he is a renowned accounting professor and had, has written the uh, textbook that's used worldwide on accounting. So when I um, started working with this particular dean, it was just as Jaron said, everything was done quantitatively. I had to, I had to prove everything through data. And uh, it was so helpful to have the information that Jaron was gathering. Um, going back to the really early days, Jaron's position was a three quarter time position. We desperately needed, we needed more from that position and uh, we needed it to become a full time position. 
I don't know if FTEs are as valued on your campus as they are on ours, but they're just um, these precious gems that are, it's just so difficult to get an FTE. But it was because of that data showing the extensive hours that our photographers were putting in that they tapped the resources on our student help that they were going be they could not go beyond any more hours than what we were giving them and then also we were able to look from the data at where those photos were being taken and looked at how much of the work was being spent um, on athletics and so I was able to go to athletics and ask for assistance in funding and uh, with their support, and they were very interested in the data. Um, they did not want to go out and get a freelance, um, get freelance photographers. So I was able to take that forward, and we were able to get that FTE. But we could not have done it without the data. We we absolutely had that to make the case because just like Jaron, I heard him say earlier, I work too much, or boy, I work a lot of hours. Well. Everyone on your president's council, everyone who is the director of communications, whatever it is, they're all working 50, 60 hour weeks. Um, but when you can go in and show, these are the weekend hours that are being worked. These are the evening hours that are being worked. And this is asking too much of someone. They can quickly see that. That's very easy to see. And uh, so it's, it's so helpful in not only talking to your boss, but your boss talking to their bosses too. Well, Carrie, and, and to your credit, you're the ones that, that keeps on asking us for more information because you show us the value of that information, how we can use it. Um, to speak to the bigger issue, Carrie, and you, you know this as well as anybody, with the budget crisis that's going on and, and constantly, photographers seem to be one of the first line items cut. And that question that I, sp I spoke of at the beginning is, is how do we help people understand our value, the bigger value that we have to the university? What, what can you say about that? Uh, um, I would say two things. Keep your data, collect your data, and then share your photos. And this has made such a difference for, for me at BYU in being able to go and ask for funding for particularly for equipment and student wages. Not only do I have the data that shows the extent of the work and the areas that we're covering and the work with our, our fundraising arm, but something that has been so helpful in bringing in even more of a, you might call it a more emotional response from our vice presidents, from our president's council, is the fact that um, Jaren and Nate have a beautiful photo shelter, photo gallery that they have available to our campus community where you could just log into it. And there are photos in every category you could ever want. And I remember through one budget hearing process, um, some questions came up about our photo needs about, wow, how can a lens cost that much money? Because it really is mind boggling two people that a lens can cost that money that much money and i remember in that in those budget hearings saying every single dean who came in and presented their powerpoint presentation every single photo in that came from our photo our photographs and that's exactly what we want because the quality is there the re the reflection of the university is exactly what we want it to be and it was very interesting as then right in that hearing, people started talking about how they'd been working on a presentation at midnight. They'd been able to go into our photo sharing gallery and download all the pictures that they needed for this presentation that they had to get on a plane and fly to at four in the morning and by you know, 10 a.m. they were giving the presentation. And that just completely changed the momentum of that, the, uh, the force I was feeling against us in that meeting to what can we do to support you? What can we do to keep this going? And so I was strongly encouraged to share and provide. We've had um, times through the history while I've been at BYU where photographers have held on a little um, more stringently to photographs. And 
just afraid of how it might be used, I will tell you, if, if you have to weigh this, be as open as you possibly can. The goodwill that that brings to you as a photographer, just that truly cannot be measured. Yeah, and Carrie and I talked about this yesterday, and that actually surprised me. That was not what I thought she would say. Um, and just for your, your guys' information, we have a Libris gallery uh, with stock images. I think we have 15,000 stock images. And people can use their university login, so staff and faculty and students can log in and have 15,000 images free of charge they can use. And again, for us, it's about maintaining the visual brand of BYU. And the, the positive benefits that we've had from that stock gallery, like, it's, like Carrie has mentioned, I never imagined all these great things would happen. But people are using our photos and they're so, so appreciative of those photos. It's just, it's been really cool. Uh, Carrie, do you mind taking a couple questions? Sure, sure. Can I say one more thing? Yes, about please. Um, BYU has, um, we have a, a very strong philosophy of helping students through student employment. Almost half of our students, our undergraduate students, work on campus. We have 13,000 jobs available. So a lot, of, a lot of financial resources are put into camping to give our students work. One of the great challenges is, is to provide meaningful work and, and that work that can help them as they go forward after they graduate um, to help them get a job. And, and so this is something that's constantly being monitored. And so in recent years, Jaron and Nate have been taking, been taking even paying closer attention to the data that um, concerns our students and the work that they are doing. That has been so helpful to me going forward. Not only do we have this superb um, photography department, but we have the mentoring that's going on. And I know there are some on our president's council who would say that is as important to them as the um, photographs that our students are coming in. And, and Jaren, Jaren and Nate can talk about this for hours, but many of our students come in there. Um, they have a major that might not lend itself to a, a job um, after, after they graduate or to job offers. And it's amazing how it has helped them to have this on their resume. Some of them have even gone into photographers, even to other universities to serve. Mark Schreiden is their um, lead photographer over their photography department. So that has been so helpful, having, having those numbers and that data to show there. I appreciate that, Carrie. Uh, guys, if you have any questions for Carrie, throw it in the chat box and uh, Nate will have them. Do you have any questions for her to start off? Um, let me see. So I've been trying to respond and go through, um, one, one that Matt brought up. Um, I'm just going to read the, uh, the statement slash question. It says devil's advocate counting hours can miss an important aspect of work life balance. And it gives an example. Employee a works 10 hours a day, five days a week. Employee B works only six hours a day, but seven days a week. Employee B works fewer hours but is on the fast track to burnout. So, uh, um, let's see. So he, the question is, um, how, if we have a way to track the non and forgive on contiguous nature of photo jobs. Yeah, I carry is, is it important to track every single thing or is it more important to focus on key things? No, and you know what, and I understand that. I um, serve as the spokesperson of our university and a few years ago, we had a person on our staff set up this elaborate mechanism to record all incoming media calls. And I was so frustrated with that because at the end of the day, I'd worked a long day, it's now 9 p.m. and I am having to fill out this log that's going to literally keep me at the office another hour. And I was really frustrated with that because I felt the same way of, you know, I am exhausted. I, and I can see where over asking people to supply data could lead to burnout. And so we had to, you have to really pay attention to what you can do. And so we developed a really easy, easy system that, um, it sounds so just so simple, but when I'd get a call, I would pull down a little clipboard and I'd scratch a little line through it. 
Now that I could do, but I could not stay an hour later from a long day and fill out exactly who to call me, what my message was, the questions that they asked. And so I would say, you have to work with what will work well for you. And this is something that um, Jaron and Nate have done. Um, so to make it as simple and as easy as possible, because if it's not simple and it's not easy, you're not going to do it. And I'm speaking from myself when I say you, that's me. I am not going to do it if it's that complicated. Yeah, don't, you don't want the task to overtake the, the meaning behind it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes I think we get these ideas that we get a new computer program and we log it all in. It may be something so easy as in my case, keeping a clipboard that I have right in front of me and I can scratch through it. Good. What else you got, Nate? Um, there's a question from Karen about any tips for approaching the exec and the executive to create a central photo department. She's in grad studies and everyone's using her images and the, they need a centralized unit. So I don't know any thoughts on approaching administration for that. That is a very good, we, um, Jaren's too young to remember this and Nate, um, but we, um, we had, did not have a centralized photo department. When I first came into the university, we had a photo studio that had existed through student life where people would go in and get their, their mug shots but we did not necessarily have a centralized place. And so when this um, photo studio went away that took the mug shots, it was really, we were dealing with some decentralization and again, um, who serves the university. This is again where the data is so, it's very helpful. Um, I think all the points that Jaron just listed, if you're going to take to your administration why having a centralized photo unit is so important. Take those, take those that Jaron has just shared with you. Also, I think the branding is critical. You want that quality to be, um, to be reflective of your university. When you have one college who will be out there taking, letting a student take pictures with their cell phone, they've had absolutely no training. Um, and then you have another who might spend tens of thousands of dollars on a photographer, get some lovely photos, but the university has no rights to them after the initial brochure goes out or whatever it is. You need to collect all of that. It, you need to collect it in data and you need to collect those scenarios to show, look what happened here. Yeah. And particularly if you can look at um, dollar amounts that are being spent that quickly adds up to where you can, if you, if you pull resources, if you show that we can have this centralized photo unit that can serve the university, it's actually going to be cheaper for us in the long run. I totally agree. Like if you had 10 departments buying cameras versus one department buying two or three cameras, money speaks volumes when you're dealing with administration, right? And if you can make a proposal to say, this is gonna make things, us not only more efficient, but more cost effective, and it's going to help our brand. That's a that's something that's really positive you can take forward. But you do need to have a written out proposal. You need to have numbers and and be as analytical as possible. Analytical and collect those um, those stories because you need your numbers. But let a story help reflect those numbers too. Because if I can go forward have good data, but I can also say give a story, give an example of what happened um, when, when a student went out and took a picture that um, didn't showcase a dean or someone in a very good light and was shown, was posted on the web page or whatever it may be. Take those, take those stories, put them with the data. What else, Nate? So I don't know if this applies it too much to uh, at least us here at BYU since we don't have a central marketing department. But um, the question is from from Evan, and I think we've still done this though. How do you pitch, Carrie? How do you pitch us, your photography team, to external clients versus hiring an ad agency for uni for a university project? I yeah. think you you kind of talked a little bit. You touched on that a little bit, um, but like he's talking about like an advancement annual report. 
That's excellent because there always is this feeling that, um, that, oh, these people on the outside have uh, this professional expertise, this creative element that maybe we just don't have within the university. Something that you can do here is, um, is this is where competitions and awards can come in very, very handy. I always, when Jaren and Nate enter a competition, and, and as you know, they do very well, I don't just take the award. I take what the judges say about their work. This even included um, your student competition that you have. Those judges who critiqued our student work, I took those comments and took the comments to the President's Council so that they can see that others recognize the quality of the work being done. Make sure that you're providing that information. Um, Jaren, I just, Jaren will send me, sometimes they'll send me the judge's sheets. If something um, has been said that's particularly pertinent, he'll send it to me right in an email and I will cut and paste that and send it out and I get it out that very night. So that, so that our vice presidents, so that our deans can see that. I want them to know that it's just not, um, I want them to know really just the, the praise that comes from others for their work. And so that's where I'd say these competitions are very valuable to you, but use those. Drain every positive word out of them. And as you're featured in whatever it may be, if you're featured in an article, if you're featured on a podcast, I always make sure that our um, administration is aware of the feedback that's coming from that. And I couldn't do that if Jaron did. I'm not, I'm not reading. Um, I am not in the know. I couldn't do that without Jaron and Nate. Do not think you're bragging. When Jaron sends, um, sends me something, um, you know, always, you know, it just comes in matter of fact, like, hey, this is, this is what we did in this competition. And, uh, you know, here's what the judges said. If you, if you find that you have a boss who's not running with that, you'll probably have to do a little more of a push, but just make sure they know. Isn't it sad, though, that it takes somebody outside university to tell you that you're good, right? Mm -hmm. Like, in, until, until you get some outside recognition, you, you're just average but oh, well, they won this award, but that's just how it is, right? And it's not just photographers, it's in other areas of the university too. So definitely take advantage of the, of the mix, take advantage of all the competitions we have. Case and UPA are great assets to us. Nate, you got another question? Um, yeah, I don't know if this one's more for you or for Carrie or for both. Um, essentially from Emily, it, just talking about the, the issues with being furloughed or whatever. Um, but the question is, um, how do we remain relevant when our ability to actually take photos has been stunted for like for right now and for the foreseeable future? Yeah, and Carrie, she's talking about basically, well, you're not taking pictures. What are you doing? How do we help communicate all these other things that we're doing that aren't as visible, that aren't seen? And, and you know, one thing, and, and if you can't get onto your campus, this is a little more difficult. But early on, we recognized that we are keeping the historical record during this COVID-19 pandemic. We are keeping the record of this for the university. No one else is out there gathering it, but you know, a year from now, 10 years, 100 years, whatever it would be, or it could be even next week, someone is going to come and say, wow, I need a picture of this and that. I need a picture of when we emptied campus. I need a picture of when the students were leaving. And so Jaron and Nate, boy, that first week, they were just working around the clock, capturing these images. And, um, and I think that's something that you need to remind them of that you are doing and how important that is. Um, we don't know, if we look back at in 1918 during the Spanish influenza, the only record we could find of that was in our student newspaper. The university did not have a record of that. 
The story wasn't told from their eyes. And so we very, very early on decided that we would tell this story for the university, that we wanted it to be captured accurately. We wanted to show how the university responded to this. So even today we had a staff meeting and we were talking about, um, we've got a competition going on right now and not a competition, we, we nixed that but the different schools are coming together to sew masks. They're using their, their thread of their school colors. And we were discussing, you know, just how Jaron and Nate could portray this, um, of the sewing of these masks and um, just um, getting into our alums' homes or how best would be to portray it. But everyone knows that Jaron and Nate are working on this visual record right now. So that's something I think that's important. Again, going back to you are the historian and is those pictures with the written word are going to be so much more powerful than just the written word and then to go a little bit deeper carrie there are some of us who are not allowed on campus at all right now and they're having a hard time convincing their bosses well i'm keywording i'm indexing i'm organizing stock galleries how do they communicate that you know and we um that is i think that's so important that you're doing that Jaron has our students working right now on um, indexing slides that we've had these slides and he has been, this goes back again to the data. Um, Jaron, each time we will meet, he will give me an update. We were able to archive um, a million slides, two million slides this past year. That's now in archives and then he'll, he'll show me just the, the historical content that we've now archived, that we've taken out of shoeboxes in essence and provided for the university that it, the university will have forever. So if you can do some of those things, if you can work with your university archivist so that you can provide those photos, and then again, that is to benefit the university, not just you, but the entire university now has access to those pictures. That's something that I would think you could certainly be doing now yeah, and it's now, Jaron, is that well, yeah, and I think it, you just have to be communicating. And you know, at BYU, we have a an annual review where we plan our projects for next year, and then we meet and we follow up. You know, I'm always talking about those long term projects, and then giving Carrie those updates. Uh, right now, this is a great time to making sure your boss knows this is what I'm doing, and here's why it's important. And, and if you don't understand, let me explain it to you really quickly. And you have to communicate that value. And I know that there's some bosses that just you know they aren't going to listen. You need to write it down. You need to communicate clearly and do what you can do. I mean, it's, it's, it's frustrating. Some bosses won't listen, but you need to do what you can do. You need to focus on doing things that are going to benefit the university. And then you need to tell that story. Yep. And I was going to say, even if you are doing some of this archival work, send to your team and your boss, send them some pictures you found. Um, I remember when Jaron found a picture of one of our former um, presidents on a camel. And Jaron sent that to me. That is a reminder of, oh my goodness, we would have lost this. We would have lost this picture had this work um, not been, have not taken place. Just to even, I'd say, even take it further, Carrie, like I say, the next two months are gonna be rough with budgets. What are some practical things that our photographers can do right now to prepare themselves for these budget cuts, these furloughs, you know, to make sure that they're in a good solid position at the university? Well, I think you're doing a marvelous thing right now, keeping up with your professional training in a way that you're not spending any travel budgets. Um, I know that travel budgets are going to be very tight on campus. And so I think as you can look at um, what you can do on campus, as much work as can be done on campus to showcase the um, faculty work that's going on, the student work, you're going to be starting back up, hopefully. Hopefully we'll be seeing that. And again, to document how that takes place and coming back after COVID-19, what takes place there. Yeah, definitely, definitely walk back into the office with lots of great ideas of how you can document, mm -hmm. how you can move forward, how you can think positive things that can happen because of it. Yeah. You have any other questions, Nate? Yeah, so just a couple more. Um, so here, here at BYU, we're pretty fortunate with uh, administrative support. The um, question is, if you don't have anyone like supervisors advocating for you, what is a good way to do this from where we're at? 
And, and that's where I would go back to sharing, sharing your, your photos. And when someone says, sends you a thank you or wow, you know, I showed this in London during this presentation, I showed your picture and everyone wanted to know, or everyone commented on the beauty of our campus, whatever it is, then share that. That can be shared. And it's, and, and it's not so much patting yourself on the back, even as professor so-and-so or dean so-and-so, I wanna share some comments that they made about our work. You've got to share it. They're, they're not going to hear that if you don't share it. So, um, so share your work and then share the positive positivity that comes back from it. Yeah, and I'd say on top of that, make sure that those administrators, the decision makers, have access to your photos. Make sure Absolutely. they have what they need. Absolutely, and and I think that goes back to again what we're talking about in collecting that you've got to make it pretty easy to get to those photos because I guarantee you, I cannot tell you how many times um, people they'll find a great photo and they'll, they're working on it at midnight at 1 a.m. and they'll want some context from me or something. They have to have it by that morning. So if they can get those pictures on their own, they don't need their secretary, they can get them on their own. That, that speaks volumes for them. Yeah, and then and when, those, when those proposals come up, the decision makers are like, oh yeah, what they're doing is awesome. I want to support them. Mm -hmm. Great. What other questions we got? Um, how often do you and Carrie meet to kind of chat and go over things? We, we are in meetings right now. We're in meetings twice a week that we have. Um, but Jaron is just fabulous that he is constant. I would say pretty much constant. He is constantly emailing me. Jaron is so good to come up to my office too, but, um, and just, just sit down and talk for a few minutes. Um, oftentimes after a staff meeting, we'll be able to connect. Like I say, we are meeting twice a week right now, which is very helpful. So as a staff, Jaron and Nate are, are in the process um, of creating a new photo studio so we probably have met more often on that than, um, than some other things that I, I would say it's pretty constant. Jaron, what would be your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I've got to say that you, Carrie's the university spokesperson, so she's not going to say anything mean about us, uh, which is great. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, Carrie's great because she gives me a lot of freedom. In fact, I go ask Carrie for permission for things. She, she always kind of is like, why are you asking? I trust you. Now, I know we all don't have that relationship with our bosses, but I think it's important to get feedback from her. And there's sometimes when she's like, well, that may actually not benefit the university as much as this might, you know, and it's a collaboration. And, and I think that you have to communicate. That's, that's a, it just comes down to it. Make sure you're communicating, make sure you know what's going on. Uh, I have saw this question here, Carrie, for you. I think this is a great one. Um, What's your opinion? This is from Joseph. What's your opinion on asking your photographers to do work outside their normal duties, like learning how to shoot and edit video in order to stretch resources? I would say um, I wouldn't turn down, look at it as an opportunity for you, a chance to actually increase your skills. We, um, we had a situation where our videographer had a year of some really poor health and Nate was able to step in and go um, on just um, several countries he was needed to go to last minute because of his great videography skills and came back. And in fact, one of our commercials that appears on um, ESPN during the football season is one that Nate provided the footage on. So I would not look at that as such, so much of a cumbersome as, as a chance to increase your skills. Yeah, I would say make yourself more valuable to your university. If you can, in the next two months, can learn, learn the basics of video, editing and shooting video, when that budget crisis comes, you're more valuable and you're harder to let go because, well, they can do all this for us. Yeah. Um, there's plenty of time right now to learn Premiere. There's plenty of time for you to, to shoot this summer. Make yourself more valuable. 
Uh, one more question. So can you share the process of getting information from our president's office? How would you recommend developing that relationship? I would say, and I don't know the structure, but um, you need to work with in the organizational chart that you have. And so you need to work with your director or, or perhaps you report right, right to a, um, and, and a vice president or someone right on the president's council, but work within, work within that framework. I wouldn't try um, overstepping those bounds because that can, that can in the end um, not help you. Um, the, the difficult thing I understand is when you feel like you're not getting to your president. Let me tell you something that we did that might be helpful. Um, we actually meet once a month. Um, Jaron and Nate aren't involved in this, but I certainly gather information from them. We meet with our president's assistant and we meet with our um, director of external relations. We meet with one of our um, community affairs folks, um, uh, several of them, but we come together and we look particularly at the president's schedule and what he has going on and what in each of our areas we need to be doing to help him to cover what he's doing. So that might be something that if you have anything like that, um, you could volunteer to be a part of. And um, Jaren and Nate, I, I hadn't even thought really about this, but maybe you would like to be a part of that meeting. Well, thanks for inviting me to more meetings, Carrie. Thank you. This is great, guys. Yeah, whoever suggested that, thank you. In fact, maybe you'd like to take my place at that meeting. Sure, why not? That's even better. So. Why not? But I, I think that's a really good point. In fact, you, were, I, I, you may want to talk a little bit about the social media report. That's oh, maybe yes. a good example. Yes, yes. I want, this is a very good thing. Um, let me just tell you, this did, did, did not, the concern was not with photography. But many years ago, we had a vice president who, some negative comments had been made to him in regard to our social media. And so he somehow got this impression that we were just not keeping up on social media. We weren't doing an adequate job. And it was very difficult for him, for me to convince him otherwise. So what we started doing, I met with him once a month, is we started going with what we called the social media report. It was two pages, front and back. And what we would do is we had numbers and we would show our reach. We always had charts on it, just like Jaron talked about, always graphs and numbers. And then you'd flip it over and then we had the qualitative. We had stories about what we were communicating on social media. And meeting by meeting, I started to see this um, vice president's attitude change. And then we started getting some really favorable comments about our social media particularly from very influential alums. And I, we put that in the social media report and highlighted it. When I would take that into the meeting, I wouldn't just leave it. I would stay there while this person read the whole thing to make sure that they read it. Then something very nice happened is we entered, um, we were able to have our um, statistics analyzed and we were able to be a part of um, a competition, so to speak, a ranking and we were named in the top 10 for social media engagement and have been able to maintain that in the top 10. But it really did, it took that report going in and just having it, the documentation there and showing. So that's another thing you can do is actually create, if you feel like you're passing on information but it's not going anywhere, create a hard copy report. Yeah, and that could even be a, your Instagram account for your for your photo department and showing here, hey, this photo was used in the cover of this magazine, right. something like that. Absolutely. Uh, I have one more question. I love this question from Jason, and if you don't mind, um, basically, there's some some feedback in the chat about how the, a lot of university, a lot of our bosses are have a negative perception of taking pictures during the COVID. You know, like we don't want to show that, and how you know how do you help them understand that this is important to have for history how do you how do you help them understand that this is part of uh, pr that we need to have how do you how do you have that conversation well i think if they can look at it as this is history this is history in the making this isn't a judgment on the university just keep it as history in the making maybe they're nervous 
that the photos are going to be used of an empty campus, however it is. So I approach it at their comfort level that right now we're taking these for historical purposes and we'll see how we need to use them in the future. But these are to be used for historical purposes. But you may, there's lots of ways to do this. We just made a beautiful video with our president. Um, he had given a speech about joy um, to our campus community a year ago. And they were able to take his comments about joy and then these, um, in this case, it was a video, but it was video of campus. It was empty, but we had an incredibly beautiful spring on our campus. And so you have all this beautiful imagery of spring on campus. And then with his words about joy. So there's ways to portray campus, the, the peace, the serenity of campus that you can capture too. Uh, great. I actually would add to that too. I sometimes just have to say, hey, we're shooting it. Doesn't mean we have to share it. That's right. It, you know, maybe this is right. something that's sensitive right now, but in a year or in 10 years or in 50 years, you're going to want these pictures. Uh -huh. So don't worry. I'm not going to share it if it makes you uncomfortable, but we should at least capture it. Capture it. And, and hopefully they, you can help them see the beauty of your campus. You know, there's nothing like a beautiful sunrise, a beautiful sunset. Um, and I'm, I would hope they would share those with their students and remind them of, remind their students of just how, what a beautiful campus you have. Well, Carrie, we really, really appreciate you spending so much time with us. We had told you 15 minutes and we completely lied. Um, but thank you so much by the, looking at the comments, everybody wants you to transfer to their university. So I'll send you a list uh, later. Um, but thank you so much. And we know you have a, another meeting to go to. So hop off whenever you need to. Okay, thank you all very much. I so appreciate all that this organization AUP does. Um, I know what a great resource and support you have been to Jaron and Nate and really, really appreciate all that you've done. I look forward to having you in 2023, is that? Hopefully, we'll see, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Okay, bye-bye. All right, guys, uh, we're going a little long, but like say, Stay with us. We're going to talk a little bit more about the shoot log. I know a lot of people have been asking about it. And let's see. So those that have been asking of how do we easily, quickly get this information, it started with a clipboard many years ago. Uh, Mark Philbrick uh, and I were trying to figure out how to make that transition to digital. And we realized we needed to have some sort of a system to keep track of all of our file names and our shoot log shoots and stuff. So we, called, we created a little spreadsheet called the shoot log. And it basically was simple. It was kind of this first three fields, you know, the date that we took the pictures, the file number and the description. That's all it was. It was really simple, right? And over the years that that has grown into something that became an Excel document and then eventually it became a, a, a Google doc that we, our holy office is used to, to track our photos. So here's how it works. Basically, uh, if you look down here on this field right here, 1901-14, that's, that's a, a shoot. Every time we go out and we take pictures, we, we pull them together into a photo shoot. 19 refers to the year, 01 is the month, 14 is the shoot number for the month, right? Um, while we're downloading our photos, we, we, we pull up the shoot log, and again, it's shared on a Google Drive, so we all have access to it. We'll put down the date of the, of the photo shoot, we'll, put, we'll do the file name, and, I'm sorry, the, the folder name, and that just is a descending uh, number. We know that it's there. We have to use the shoot log to get that number, and that's one thing that's really great about our system, is nobody can just go rogue and come up with their own thing you have to use this system. So for example, this is the dunk team video. Here's Elder Uchtdorf's devotional. Uh, if you can look, the photographer right here is a drop down field uh, that will come up with the, with the names of all our photographers. If there's an assistant, this is just a drop down menu that's already populated with the same group of photographers. Then the total number of frames that we shoot, we put in here. Now I do wanna make the point that, that frames is a very important statistic for us. Um, and Matt Kishore reminded me that, you know, this is something we should need to make sure is, is conveyed. More pictures does not necessarily mean better, right? More pictures does not necessarily mean you're more productive. You can shoot a football game and come with 10,000 pictures, you know, in two hours. And in two hours, you can shoot campus and come away with 100. It's just, for us, it's a very important metric to help us get cameras. Because we, when we're doing budget requests, you know, we can prove that, well, these cameras have a life cycle of 300 or 500,000 frames. Essentially, we, we say the life cycle ends, and that helps us have uh, statistics and data to ask for more cameras. 
The next thing is the, the hour spent on the shoot, and that's from the time we leave the office to the time we come back. We try to be approximate on that, but you know, to the quarter hour. Uh, and then again, our assist, if we have an assistant with us, it's in the assistant hours. Uh, then the next field is, is departments, and every single campus department's already entered in here. And in fact, we forgot to enter it on this one, so let me hurry and do it now. It's just a drop down menu, all the athletic teams, everything like that. Our, for our department, it's university communications, so it's really easy to come right there. And you're showing my mistakes right in front of everyone. Thanks. Yeah, Nate screwed everything up, guys. He's not perfect, just close. Uh, and then the contact information, you know, it's going to be Todd Hollingshead, who's the contact for the shoot. Uh, we have a yes or a no if we charge uh, for that shoot. Um, the, and then my secretary, she can invoice it here, have a billing code, campus card, all that kind of stuff. And that's it. By, usually by the time the photos are downloaded to our computer, we've already filled out all this information and we're done. And what happens when everybody uses this, at the end of the year, we've done this and it just has macros. At the end of the year, it compiles all that data. So you can look at my January totals here. In January of 2019, I shot 28,478 frames in 33 hours and with 18 different shoots. It does that for every single photographer for every single month of the year. And then it automatically compiles all this data into different fields and then automatically builds charts. And you can see our busy time of the year is March and then August, August kind of through you know middle of October. Our low time is in June. This is when we're at symposium. It's all symposium's fault that we're not there. Um, and that's just, it's automatically tabulated. We don't have to do anything to make this happen. And in fact, if you go and look at the next field, uh, here's all the different departments we work for on campus and it's broken down by how many frames we shot for the department, how many hours and how many shoots. So I can look at the McKay School of Education and see that last year, that year I shot 5,435 pictures, you know, all the sub departments that are in the, the colleges and stuff. And then over here, we have department totals. So we can break everything down by department. We have the percentages of, of you know, hours, shoots, everything, how many frames are shot. Athletics has a lot of frames because, you know, again, football games and that kind of stuff, it's a lot more frames than something for the Marriott School. And then here's that pie chart that automatically creates for department frames, department hours, department shoots, department average. Um, and then it, it also creates this tabulates this year total. And this is what I give Carrie. I just print this sheet out. I don't have to do anything when the year's over. I print this out and I give it to Carrie. It shows our productivity. It, and, and then in the very last sheet is just the summary totals. And this is one that she uses a lot, breaking down you know, hours and shooting and it shoots assisting and stuff by, by us and then by our students. The students, she mentioned it's really important to use those to show how much we're mentoring our students. They shot a lot that year. Um, and then how much we're doing specifically for our department. That's one of the metrics she always asks us for. So this, this shoot log was created over time with the help of a lot of students that went in and figured out how to make macros. I don't know any of this stuff. All I have to do is put the information in and it works. And we know that this is something that's gonna be valuable for you. So we've created a template that we're sharing with everybody today. And it's going to make it so that you can very quickly and very easily make it ad adapt it to your photo office put your names in it, put your departments in it and use it. So I'm Gabe Mayberry, who's a former student who now works at UVU. He actually is the one that's been spearheading this for us because I don't get the macros. I'm going to, I'm going to let him take over and, and talk about how you can do that. You ready, Gabe? I am. Thanks for the little intro. Yeah. So I'm Gabe Mayberry. I'm one of Jaren's former students and kind of just to talk about um, what Carrie mentioned before, the, the mentorship and the leadership styles that BYU Photo provided helped me land my job at UVU before I even graduated. So uh, that is just one of the benefits of kind of what we were talking about before. Um, and as Darren said, we're going to be sharing this link with you for the shoot log. I've been helping him kind of polish it out and make it as simple as possible. Let me put the link to the shoot log here in the chat so you can do uh, follow along there. And let me share my screen. And here is um, also another view of the shoot log URL. Um, like I said, I put it in the shoot log or in the Zoom chat so you can see it from there. Um, this link will provide you with the UPA original copy. You're going to see that it's a view only format. We want to be sure that um, this stays nice and clean. So I'm going to show you how to copy it and make it usable in your own drive. Um, so if you have the original copy opened up, all you have to do is go to file, 
make a copy. And then I always like to make two copies of things like this. Um, so I'll make like an original copy. So I can always refer back to change if I need to. I'll just put it in this folder, for example, create a new one. Let's call it CPA resources, put it there. Okay, so that'll be my original copy, my own personal original copy that I can go in and look at. And I'm also gonna be making another copy, it doesn't hurt to have. And this is the copy that I'll be able to edit from. And I'll show you how to quickly change the data that you need to um, to get started on this. Right here. And so while that's loading, you can go back to your Google Drive. And like Jaren said, we've, we've chosen to use this in Google Drive. Um, we know that Excel is a lot more powerful with macros and everything like that, but where sharing and collaboration is such a high priority, we chose to use the Google Sheets version of this. Um, so um, here is our original copy that we made. And then that should have put that in there. Um, so like I said before, we made this as simple as possible for you. Um, the first thing you're gonna wanna most likely do is change the different photographers. Um, and so that, all these instructions are gonna be right here. We've created a separate tab that'll walk you through everything you need to know that I'm gonna be talking about today just briefly. Um, it gives you a step-by-step, -step, but let me show you just right here. Um, anything that's labeled in green or shaded in green, those are cells that you can freely change. Everything labeled in red, those are cells that you're not wanting to change because then that will screw up the, the macros and the formulas. So let's say I got my job at UVU and I'm gonna to wanna to take this um, template from BYU and convert it over to UVU's. So uh, the photographers that we have at UVU are August Miller, we have Jay Drowns, and we have myself, Gabe Mayberry. And what you'll see is that changed everything that needed to be here. Um, you, like I said, you don't have to touch anything right there. Um, if, um, so Jaren's original log has a lot of students. So he breaks his students down in a category. If you need to make another row, all you have to do is highlight those rows selected, make a new row, insert, shift down, and then you're gonna wanna be able to copy that formula down, just like that. So you're gonna be wanting to make sure that all those cells are referenced correctly. Um, and you're just doing copy and paste right here, Gabe? Say that again? You're just doing copy and paste? Yeah, so what I'm doing is dragging the cell down, so I'm making sure that I am keeping the formula. Okay. So simple as that, now I have my own space, and I'll start keeping track of that. And what if people don't up? have this many photographers? If you don't have this many photographers, it's really easy, Just you can just delete all this. Um, and it's better to just leave it as the blank space um, otherwise you could start messing up the formulas. Doesn't hurt to have the blank spaces. Um, you could, if you want to, you can hide the cells, but it won't hurt to, to just make them blank. It will probably hurt to delete cells. Um, and so let's go over to our departments. University communications is what BYU uses, for example, but I'm gonna change it to what we use over at uh, UVU. University marketing. We'll go from that. We have created services. I already put that in the last time. Photography and we'll put production. So here we have all those branches underneath university marketing. What it's done is it's changed university marketing over here. So you can see it tabulating correctly. And then that also automatically changed it in our graphs. So we don't have to worry about anything. It's not showing up here because there's no data for it. But once we put in some data for that, then it'll work well. Um, also, be sure not to change the tab names on the months. Um, that will also um, mess up some of your data. And so then the next thing they need to do is clear all this information that's here right now. How do they do that? Uh-huh. So what you can do just to clear this off, 
you just highlight these cells and you can just simply push delete. Everything will be the same as long as you're not reformatting the cells. If you just select that and delete it, it will go from there. Yeah, and then go ahead and fill out a field real quick just so it shows it showing up. Yeah, so let's say I did a shoe on the 5th of May. Um, here at UVU, we don't use the same file naming structure at BYU. Uh, BYU does. So we just, um, at, B at UVU, I just hit that lot, hit that slide or column. We don't use that. We rely on each other to make sure that our log is always updated. Let's say I went and did some campus stock photography. I was the photographer. I didn't add that in there. But yeah, you deleted your name. So August did it. We'll say August was the photographer. We can make it so Jay was the assistant. Put in thousand frames. We'll make it so he spent two hours on it. Jay helped him for an hour. Um, and this is a new version as of this year for BYU Photo. Um, and I've kind of taken that on our personal UV log and I've made it a little bit bigger, but you can also differentiate between the nights and weekends um, and the mornings that you're working. That's also a very helpful table that I can show you in a minute. Yeah, and that's, and again, that's important for us to show how many nights, weekends, it automatically will tabulate it for us because Carrie wants to know that information. So that's a new addition this year and we're, we're, we really like having that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what we're gonna show is at University Marketing, it is going to pull the frames and the hours. So if we can go over here, we can find our University Marketing. Let's see, might not have gone there. Perfect. So we have the, the frames that we just put in, 1,000 frames, two hours, um, and how many shoots it was. This is just the simple counting uh, formula. So there you go, that's how it pops up. And that's about as, that's about as basic as we've been able to make it. Um, and how I said before, if we wanna see a breakdown of how many nights and weekends each photographer is working, that's automatically filling in right there as well. We listed the August work tonight, so it's showing up right there. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's about it. And just go back to the instruction thing again, and just sure. explain that like, all you need to do is go here and he'll walk you through every single step in this instruction tab. Yeah, so this will show you how to make a copy, just how I did at the beginning of this. It will show you the definition of terms, what each column is actually doing, um, kind of what we're meaning by each column. It will show you the different tabs and the totals and the graphs, what they're doing, what they're analyzing. Um, and I'll just kind of show you some important notes, how to change your photographers and then how to change the departments again. So, like I said, when I went to UVU, I took BYU's and I changed it just a little bit to meet my needs. So I wasn't able to rely on Jaren for any of that help. Um, me and Jaren have made it. So if you want to stick to this basic format of the BYU shoot log, Here's exactly how to do that. If you're going to want to change it up and customize it even further, we may not be able to help you because neither one of us are computer scientists, but, um, but feel free to contact any of us for some general tips and tricks on the shoe lock. Yeah, so, and, and this is something that we feel like can be really beneficial. Um, it's helped us so much over the years. I've shared the shoot lock many times with other photographers at other universities. To all those guys, download this one. This one is so much better, use it. I would even say if you're, if you're wanting to track this data while you're at home, this would be a good time. You could start the 2020 log and enter your information in from January forward, and then you'll be able to benefit from that information and that compilation of, of data immediately. Yeah, but uh, this, is, that, this is a great resource. Yeah, for those people that already had the shoot log from Jaren before, it's really easy to convert um, all your data levels and put into the old version into this new version. I did that with UVUs yesterday, actually. So uh, Gabe, a, a question, um, there's people asking about different things to, to add on here, whether it's tracking your post-processing hours or scouting hours or different things like that. Is that something that's simple to do or is that something where you just find somebody on campus that knows Excel and adds to it? Um, you so could do I, assisting hours could be changed to like production hours if you wanted, right? Yeah, um, assisting hours could be changed to post-processing. To post um, like I said, here's our UVU shoot log. 
I've added this pulse processing column. Um, and if we go back into our data over here, I've made it so on my month totals, it's consistent. So I want to keep the format of everything consistent. So if there, if on my tab, it's tracking each month's frames, hour shoots, I've also made it so it's pro, um, tracking the pulse processing. And basically what it's going to be, it's going to be the same formulas as everything else. All you have to do is just make that category and copy that formula. So you'll see this post processing column that I've added. It's the same exact formula as the, um, what we already had for the frames. So you'll just need to be attentive, um, making sure that you're adding columns correctly. Um, and if you add it, if you change something on one month, you're gonna have to make sure that you change it in the other months. And you're always gonna want to be sure everything is perfectly consistent. So if I'm gonna be adding a column right here after J, I need to be sure and go on each of the months and add the same column in the same spot. Because if the columns are named differently on different months and tabs, then you're going to run into the problem of the formula that's not working. Yeah, we've tried to make this as simple and robust. You know, we can help you with small changes, but like I say, a lot of questions here about integrating with other software, that's beyond our abilities. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple, though, for, you know, people that know that uh, to take this. It's just a macro spreadsheet. And uh, they can t feel free to take it and run with it and do whatever you want to do with it. Do we have any other questions for Gabe? Um, sorry, I've been getting ready to respond. Um, I don't think so. Not anything that we haven't covered. If I'm wrong, then somebody uh, let me know on here. I joined in late. Uh, where can I download this? Oh, I just put the, the tiny URL link in the chat for Zoom, and then I'll also be posting it to Facebook as well after. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, we'll go ahead and take any other questions that anybody has right now. Gabe, do you wanna unshare your screen? Hey, Jared. Yes. Um, I kind of took what you did and modified it to work in a very simple form, which was I just color-coded shoots in my Outlook calendar and then started totaling them by year and adding those into an Excel sheet. Um, <clears throat> it resulted in, surprisingly, um, took about a year and a half, showed my boss the data, results in a promotion and a new position added. Just the data alone did that. It was unbelievable. Um, I couldn't, it was, I was ready for a fight and it wasn't, it was like, oh my, look at the data. Okay, this is what we need to do. Um, it's amazing how data speaks. Yeah. Now, if we hadn't had a virus, we'd be adding a position this summer, but hiring freeze. So I got a promotion and more work um, and no new help. But well, I'll, I never wake up in the morning excited to go work on the shoot log, right? Yeah. But the, the value that it gives us and helps us to tell who we, our value to the university has helped us so many times in so many different ways. It's worth the 30 seconds it takes after a shoot to enter that information. That's all. It's not, it doesn't take long at all. And the, but the, the data is so valuable. And right now, more than ever, we need to have that valuable information. And Jaren, if I could talk to this one question that was asked, yeah. um, how do you share access to the shoot log? So BYU Photo has one central Google Drive account. Um, so all the students can log into that as well. You can also share the sheet individually with people through yeah. an email account. So you can also work from inside a Google Drive account, from the BYU photo account, and you can also work individually from, let's say if Jaron shared it individually to my Gmail account, we can go from there. There's a funny story behind that. When Mark and I were using the log, we would actually have to physically go get the clipboard from one another to, to add shoots. And we would be like entering information at the same time. That's why we started doing it on Excel. We did it as a shared Excel document, but then, you know, Excel, when you share it, it doesn't, it's not as good as like uh, Google Sheets is awesome. We can have all of us on it at the same time, entering our, our data after a football game or whatnot, and it works great. And a fair warning, um, if you're gonna try to download this BYU photo shoe log to an Excel format and then work off, it will change your formulas. So Excel and Google Sheets don't always work nicely together. Yeah, Google Sheets is a great solution for this. Keep it in the cloud. What other questions you got, Nate? 
Um, I think we're good other than uh, I think you've addressed everything. Okay. Again, I'm, as I'm trying to follow, do multiple things, who, whoever's listening, if I missed your question, then feel free to copy and paste it again. Or, or just chime in. Uh, Jaron, Nate, can I say something really quick about Please. this? Please. Um, when, when we hired Nate at UVU, he kind of uh, brought that over from Jaron from BYU. And we've been using it pretty much ever since. And I just want to echo how valuable it is to have that data but also that every university is slightly different in their needs and how things work. And we slightly customize things as you can see from what BYU has, because the, the um, data that we need for our managers and our people above us is slightly different than what Jaron needs. And so the, the beauty of this is that you can, you know, customize this stuff. We put in post-processing because that's a really important thing for us because we do so much post-processing and, retouching and other things that um, for other departments and we needed that category specifically so that we could show upper management how much time was being spent in that area. So I think it's very really valuable to take this and use it and then customize it specifically for your university because that data is really, really important to have. So I just Absolutely. kind of put in that shameless plug for it, but also say that, you know, it's adaptable. And now Absolutely. we have Gabe, Gabe on board, so we're even better set. So he can us. actually fix it for you. Exactly. <laughs> so he can actually fix it for us. So there we go. I'm, I'm telling you, like, and I totally agree with that. You know, this is our solution. This is what we need. This is what works for us. Feel free to adapt it to any way you have. I know different universities have different needs. This this has helped us, but run with it. Go have fun with it. I mean, this well, maybe not fun. You guys are looking pretty bored, um, but. One this will thing. bless you. It will benefit your position. So one more thing too, th this is something that you can do retroactively, right? You can go back whatever, however much data you have with regards to your photo shoots and however you keep track of that. When I started at UVU or when we started this, I went back, back retroactively, I don't know, a couple of years. So you can actually start your data set. Um, it may not be as robust as moving forward, but you can go back for years and have that data to be able to present as well as moving forward. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you can do right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go. Um, well, we've gone a bit over, but I like to say, I, I think this has been a valuable discussion and I really, again, really appreciate Carrie Jenkins to come and join us and uh, love her valuable insight to hear the boss's perspective. I think it's good for all of us. Um, but as we said, when we started the UPA live discussions, we've got a lot of lemons. Let's go make some lemonade. Let's take advantage of the time we have and let's, let's be proactive and let's, uh, let's do the best we can to, to benefit our universities. And that, that, that will, that will help us in the long run. So thank you. Thank you everybody for being here and, uh, you guys have a great day.